Can everybody see that? Yes. All right. Thank you very much for that. Um, participants, I have been doing emergency medicine for a long time. And as um, you might be aware that emergency medicine moves at a very quick pace. So here I've tried to slow things down so that we can potentially work together some of the uh, some of the things that I will be teaching you today or talking about today. So if everybody could have a pen and a paper handy, then we'll go through these together. So you've got about 10, 15 seconds to go grab yourself a pen and a paper and we'll work, to, we'll work our way through what I'm going to talk you through it. My topic today is going to be about common emergency investigations that you will come across in your careers, no matter where you would be working and in whatever specialty you might be working. It might be as a GP, it might be as an emergency physician, it might be as a generalist or as an internist. So just to have a quick look at those. Okay. So the most important thing from my perspective I would like to, I will summarize at the end of my presentation what the, what the few things are that I would like you to take away from today. But the first things are, number one, clinical correlation. Everything that you see in front of you has to be matched up to the patient in front of you. Clinical correlation, again, it's not a typo. I've done that on purpose. If you are matching what you are seeing in front of you with the patient in front of you, you can't go wrong, okay? You must always match things to what you are seeing. If the patient is happy sitting there quite comfortably looking at you and you are seeing, and the ECG in front of you is a bit bizarre, look at your patient again. Make sure you've got the right investigations for the right, right patient. And third, but not the least, clinical correlation. I cannot emphasize this enough. People have looked at chest x-rays and have found a pathology or have deemed them normal and have missed a shoulder dislocation that was evident on the chest x-ray. They have seen a chest x-ray looking for pulmonary edema and completely missed the massive pneumothorax that was sitting in front of them, but they, because they were not looking for it, they did not see it. So if you're not looking for something, you're not going to see it. So the common tests that you will come across in an emergency department or in the community are going to baseline blood tests. These include a full blood count, which include your things like hemoglobin, white cell count, et cetera. You will have your electrolytes. These include your um, urea creatinine, your renal functions, your salt levels, et cetera. You have your ECGs, tricky. I still find them quite complex to read. X-rays. Most commonly, you will find chest X-rays, which is which is what I have included in in this in this talk today. There are lots of other X-rays that you might come across. There might be X-rays of limbs or of pelvis, abdomen, etc. But chest X-rays, by far, I find are the most common things that we look at. And a urine dip. Okay. Straightforward bedside investigations that you must be able to interpret correctly. So, like in, um, I have been commended on this on various occasions that I make the audience speak, but obviously since that we can't do today, we're going to work through these things that needs to go away. Okay, so a 23 year old male has come to you because they're feeling unwell with cough and fever. So I'll just let that sink in for a few minutes or a few seconds. 23 year old male, he's unwell with cough and fever. Could be anything, doesn't give you very much at the moment. So do you do their glucose? And it's more than 35. You do their ketones and they're 6.4. And, and you see there, Full blood count and it gives you a white cell count of 18 and a hemoglobin of 134. So these numbers don't mean anything at the moment. 
because I haven't given you any units for them. Okay. Being based in the UK, my glucose is measured in millimoles per liter. Okay. So the normal range for millimoles per liter is four to six. Being in Pakistan or anywhere else in the world where they use milligrams five by 18, and the number you get is the glucose that would be pertinent to you, to where you are. And this is what I was, before I was coming to give this talk, I was asked to give the normal ranges. And I said, I am missing them out so that I can talk about this point. Numbers without what they are being measured in means nothing. So you have to be very, very careful to know exactly what is being measured. So more than 35 millimoles per liter in UK terms is very, very high. Okay, our, our blood glucose machines only read up to about 35. And if it's coming more than 35, that means that it is actually not being able to calibrate it above. So it's probably a lot more than 35. And his ketones are 6.4 which is again measured in millimoles per liter, and the normal range for that is less than 1.5. So from that, that's a bit raised as well. The hemoglobin is the other, other disparity. Now hemoglobin is very curious. It's measured in about six different ways, okay? In the UK, we do it in grams per liter. And so 134 for a male is in the normal range and white cell count is 18, which is raised. So if you have any ideas of what might be going on, now would be a time to scribble on your piece of paper to think about what this potentially could be. And if you wanna type it in the chat box, and I'm sure, uh, it's coming forward. Uh, yes, ma'am, many of them have answered that it's diabetic ketoacidosis. Uh, Dr. Faizan has said it's bacterial infection. Maryam Mokhtiar is saying diabetic ketoacidosis. Aisha Sindhu is saying diabetic ketoacidosis with pneumonia. And All right, so now I'll give you a few more tidbits of information that you have got. I'll give you a arterial blood gas, which again is a bedside quick investigation that you can interpret. And this is, thank God, is universal. So it, the language that the ABG speaks is quite common, is, is the common one that we all share. So pH is seven, lactate of five, base excess of minus 10, bicarb of 15, PO2 of 12, this is on air, and PCO2 of 3.4. So putting all the picture together, you have some idea that this may be DKA with bacterial infection. You do his ECG and this is what you get. Again, on a piece of paper, if you have an idea what this is, then please feel free to either write in the chat or on your piece of paper so that you have something to discuss at the end. It's a bit fast, it's narrow complex, it seems regular, and you can see P waves. So my intention was that it is a... Uh, many of them are saying it's sinus tachycardia. Absolutely it's... correct, absolutely correct. It is sinus tachycardia. And that's his chest x-ray as you do it. So. This guy has this pathology, which is a right basal pneumonia, which is then driving his DKA. So it's an insulin dependent diabetic with DKA due to right basal pneumonia. Now the important bits are, did you ask the, have you asked the questions? 
have you put everything together with the patient's presentation with the investigations that you were seeing in front of you? And if you have, then give yourself a pat on the back because you're on the right track. And so now that you are on the right track, you would know what needs to be done, which is antibiotics, lots of fluids and insulin. So our next person is a 56 year old female who's generally unwell and, you've, and she's brought in her full blood count that was done yesterday. White cell count is two, neutrophil is 0.9 and her hemoglobin is 87. So any ideas, feel free to write in the chat. And Dr. Friall, if you could um, read out anything that's coming through, that'd be amazing. Um, Mohammed Adnan is saying it could be viral infection. Mohammed Azim Imran is saying it could be pancytopenia. Fatma Tahir is asking for platelet count. And Sidra Azizuddin is saying it could be anemia. Uh, many of them are saying pancytopenia, anemia, viral infection. Okay. So then you have the electrolytes and the corrected calcium is 3.5 and glucose is 2.2. So corrected calcium, I can tell you again, being in the UK, it's millimoles per liter. Normal calcium, corrected calcium range is 2.2 to 2.63. And glucose is low. Now, putting all those things together, yes, I agree there's pancytopenia, but concentrate on this number, which is the neutrophil count, which is less than one. And add this one to potentially this one. So, neutropenia with hypercalcemia. In a 56-year-old female who's generally unwell, you decide to do a gas which shows a lactate of four. And you do an ECG, which gives you this. Which is a... Hyperkalemia. Hypercal well, no, I no, cal potassium is not raised. This is a fast AF. It's atrial fibrillation. It's narrow complex. It's irregular. You can't see P waves. Sarah Rashid is saying uh, hyperthyroidism. And then you get an X-ray done, and this is the X-ray. These are your classical cannon bond lesions. Pathognomonic for. So um, they are just seeing ovarian cancer, some mats, uh, they might be lung cell, small cell carcinoma, cancer okay. with mats, and all that. Cannon ball lesions. Thank you, Priyal. Thank you very much for that. Um, Cannonball lesions are metastatic lesions where the primary is not in the lungs, okay? So this lady, when you dig a little deeper, has metastatic breast cancer, which is precipitating her AF. And because of the metastatic cancer, she's got neutropenic sepsis. And is that because it's metast metastases into the bones, it's giving you hypercalcemia as well. So there's lots and lots of things that are going on. Okay, so if you have very little investigate, very little interaction with the patient, the patient would tell you all these things themselves. Again, brings me home to the point that speak to your patient. Talk to the person in front of you and you will probably get to and then match the investigations to, excuse me, what they are telling you. So the treatments would be antibiotics, lots of fluids, because you have to treat the hypercalcemia with fluids before you start giving them drugs to normalize the calcium. 
45 year old male is coming in with coughing. You can see the pattern emerging here where you guys are doing most of the work, even though this is all virtual. Well done audience. So 45 year old male has come in with coughing and chest pain. He's got Y cell count of five, his neutrophil count is 3.4, his lymphocyte count is 0.8. His D-dimer is 2,890. D-dimer in England is measured in nanograms per milliliter and less than 500 is normal or less than 500 is negative D-dimer. Troponin is 800. Troponin is measured in nanograms per liter and less than 30 is normal. Oh dear, what's going on with this young many, man? Then? Many of them has said that it might be COVID pneumonia. It might be pulmonary embolism. Um, Give yourself a pat on the back, audience. Well done, because this is exactly what it is. It is a very, very topical case. His ABG shows pH of 7.2, PO2 of 8.9, PCO2 of 6.3, saturating at 89% on air, and his bicarb is 23. That is his chest x-ray. So since we are amongst very, very clever people, how are we going to treat it, audience? Type away in the chat. Harun Iqbal is asking, what is FiO2? 21%. It's on air. This gas was on air. Muhammad Azim is saying ventilator support. Sarah Rashid is saying antibiotics and steroids and uh, oxygen. Um, Dr. Azhar Mazur is saying the um, Glyxine, oxygen, VQ scan, and then we have remdesivir, we have antibiotics, we have steroid, we have warfarin, we have oxygen, dexamethasone, azithromycin, and glyxine. We have yes. rivaroxabine, Dr. Patma, uh, Tahir is saying this. Okay, so just from the super, super quickly, the VQ scan is not going to be any use in this person because, this, because the chest x-ray looks like this. It will have to be a CTPA if that is what you're looking for. However, you wouldn't need a CTPA for this person for this chest x-ray. So his diagnosis is COVID pneumonitis with myocarditis. And in England, this, is, this was one of the far more common diagnoses that we actually saw. We saw a lot of young people coming in with COVID pneumonitis and their chest x-rays looked like this. And they were talking to us and sitting up and they had myocarditis. The treatment, is oxygen, you have to give them positive pressure ventilation. Normally, what the intensivists have seen is the patients who went on the ventilator did not do very well. So patients who got intubated with COVID did not recover as well as patients with non-invasive ventilation. So your CPAP, your continuous positive ventilation in intensive care made a lot more of a difference for them and they had better outcome. Dexamethasone was the other treatment that they found was functioning quite well with these patients. Again, it was to do with the inflammatory response that the lungs were having. Okay, so well done audience, really good. So 89 year old male has come in with hematuria. His hemoglobin is 120, his white cell count is 13, and his platelets are 300. His INR is 9. Again, one, this, is, this warms my heart when we are all speaking the same language. So INR is international um, randomized, uh, normalized ratio. So it is a, it's an international number, which is same across the whole world. And that's 9. And urine, when you see it, it's frank blood. What would you do? So, well, you know that, that it's a prolonged INR causing hematuria. So why would you get a, why would you get a prolonged INR and what would you do in this specific patient? 
So many of them are saying CA prostate, they're saying stop using. Um, stop, stop using, using any coagulant if you're using any. Vitamin K, fresh frozen plasma should be given. CA prostate is their diagnosis. Um, further history, bladder carcinoma, someone is saying Aisha, Sandhu is saying bladder carcinoma. Uh, Risha Khan is asking, is he using any medicine? So this uh, is a gentleman who's on warfarin and that's what's pushed his INR to nine and that's why he's got frank hematuria. So we do reversal of warfarin. Reversal of warfarin is done by number one, stopping the warfarin. Number two, you actually reverse it by giving vitamin K. Vitamin K does not immediately act because it is actually causing the liver to produce the clotting factors that are required that the warfarin is acting on. You give fresh frozen plasma and you give a prothrombin complex concentrate, okay, which consists of the uh, uh, the complexes that warfarin works against. And you put a three-way catheter because you do not want this patient to go into clot retention. 75-year-old male has come in because he's found collapsed. He's now sitting up in front of you, chit-chatting. That is his ECG. The patient is com completely normal and sitting in front of you, talking to you with this ECG. Are you worried and why? Or if you're not worried, why not? Um, Muhammad Iqbal is saying it's a hard block. Uh, Lyaka Chaudhary is saying it's MI. First degree hard block, EV dissociation. Maria Mokhtar is saying hard block. Faisal Javed is saying bradycardia. Risha Khan is saying PR and Jobul is prolonged. Have to give vitamin K. Heart block, first degree heart block. I'm sorry, Salma Walid is saying ready, Padia. Okay, this is not a first degree heart block. This is a third degree heart block. So the person who said AV dissociation is completely correct. Now, if you can you see my mouse moving, my array? There's a P, there's a P, there's a P, there's a P, a P, a P, a P, a P, and QRS is separately marching along. It's basically a divorced couple. They're just not talking to each other at all. Okay, so there has been a complete miscommunication between the PR complexes, the P complexes and the QRS. So this is a third degree heart block. First degree heart block does not give you a collapse. Bradycardia, not this degree of bradycardia will give you a collapse. It's because it's a complete dissociation. So the treatment would be a pacemaker. Right. So a 46 year old Asian male, Asian male has come in with central crushing chest pain. He's quite clammy, quite sweaty in front of you. And he says, oh yes, my dad died of a heart attack when he was 47. He's a smoker and that is his ECG. Share away what you think and what is your treatment going to be? They're think, uh, saying acute MI, myocardial infarction. Um, Mohammed Iqbal is saying acute MI, inferior wall MI. Dr. Fahim is saying that. Okay. So depending on where you are, depending on where things, what situation you're in, where you find yourself, it's an inferior ST elevation MI, you're absolutely correct. And so the treatment will depend on either chemical intervention and we're going down the thrombolysis route, depending on where you are. If you have facilities close to you that can, um, that can do a PPCI, then that's what the current gold standard treatment is. This patient should be in cat lab. So you give them aspirin, you give them clopidogrel, you give them fundaparanex, which is a which is a type of low molecular weight heparin, 
and you give them morphine because he's in a bit of pain. But it has to be a percutaneous um, coronary angiogram and intervention. 68 year old has come in with acute shortness of breath. That's quite vague, isn't it? When you do an ABG, you find a pH is 7.34, PO2 is 8.9, PCO2 is 9.2, saturating at 82%, this is on air. Any thoughts? So they are saying it's pulmonary embolism. Uh, Haroni Kwal is saying acute severe asthma, pulmonary embolism, COPD exacerbation, pulmonary embolism, respiratory alkalosis they have found, and COPD. So you send them, thank you, sorry for you. Um, and you send them across to have a chest x ray. And so that's the chest x-ray. Now what are you going to do? So they're saying acute exacerbation of COPD, type 2 respiratory failure is here, pulmonary edema is here, it's COVID, it's pneumothorax, it's acute pulmonary edema, we have COPD, we have acute respiratory distress syndrome, ERDS. Someone is asking if it could be TB. And it could very well be. You know what? I came across this um, when I was Googling the chest x-ray for pulmonary edema. The number of times I hit pulmonary edema with TB, it was amazing. So it could very well be, but no, it isn't. It isn't miliary TB. I completely agree with you. That is what it looks like. But no, this was my attempt at finding pulmonary edema. Okay. So ARDS, again, it could be ARDS, but it is acute pulmonary edema. Your COPD x-ray doesn't necessarily look like this unless there is a um, coexisting pulmonary edema happening as well. But this is pretty classic of white, white fluffy shadows bilaterally, which gives you pulmonary edema, which pulmonary edema gives you. How would you treat it? Muhammad Azim is saying cardiomegaly is also there. Yeah. Rabia, Rabia Lodi is saying we are going to give Lasix, antibiotics, diuretics. Um, yes, they are coming up with these ideas. Diuretics, antibiotics, head elevation, oxygen, bronchodilators, and Which oxygen. Bronchodilators is too wide. So I will tell you, if I if you go to your nurse, and tell them, oh, I want some bronchodilators, they will probably stick them on um, salbutamol and nebulizer. Okay, so this is acute pulmonary edema, probably because of the cardiomegaly that somebody's noticed, probably because of that. But the treatment, I would react to it is yes, I completely agree diuretics would be part of my treatment. A GTN infusion. Yes. Okay, venodilate them, or positive pressure ventilation. Again, continuous positive pressure ventilation to force the fluid out of the lungs would be your, would, depending on how unwell that patient is and how quickly you can get them into a setting where they can have that. 24 year old, tall, thin male, acute onset of shortness of breath. What investigation would you like? You get one investigation for him, I think. Chest X-ray. Yes, thank you. Cool chest X-ray. <laughs> and that's your chest X-ray. So, uh, pneumotonics, Marfan syndrome. Yes, absolutely. Thank Not diagnosed yet. They're coming up with the pneumotonics. Uh, Sobia Siddiqui is saying pneumothorax. Amjad Hassan is saying tension pneumothorax. Maria Mukhtiar is saying pneumothorax. Shazia Asim is saying pneumothorax. Someone is asking if we cardiomegaly. No, not cardiomegaly, not tensioning, not tensioning yet. Not tensioning yet because your trachea is still fairly central. If your trachea was here, I'd be a bit worried. 
And he's sitting in front of you, if you notice. He's just sitting there, acute onset of shortness of breath. That is all he's got. Okay, so, so yes, it's on the right. Sorry, say that again. It's spontaneous pneumothorax for a thinning patient. Um, right sided pneumothorax with lung collapse. And, and what will, will you do? How will you treat intubation. it? Chest tube intubation is a treatment. They are saying. Chest tube intubation, what does that mean? Needling. Someone is saying needle, chest tube, chest tube intubation and oxygen. Okay, so I would what? interpret that as putting a chest drain in. Is I, I'm, I'm hoping that that's what you mean, that you have to release this. Uh, okay, so right-sided uh, spontaneous pneumothorax and treatment is needle decompression. You can decompress quite quickly and then you put a chest drain in. Okay, again, depends on what kind of setting you're in, depends on what you have available and how quickly you can get them into a, in, into a place where all those things can be um, taken care of. And that was me. So do you have any questions? Uh, I think the panelists will be answering those questions, but if you have any questions specifically for me, then ask now, or I can then conclude with my last slide. So they all are saying it's excellent session. Oh, Dr. thank you. Dr. Ambarini Riaz is saying this. It's an excellent session, ma'am. Beautifully explained. Everyone loved the session. With GTN, it means it's they're asking, what is GTA GTN means? Uh, Harun Iqbal is asking how to differentiate between COVID pneumonia and pulmonary edema. So I guess, ma'am, yeah, I think we can start with panelist introductions and question and answer session. Uh, yes. So we have got four panelists over here. Um, I'm moving to Dr. I'm moving to Dr. Muhammad Adil Iqbal first. Uh, he'll introduce himself and will then answer your questions. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your. Uh, I'm Dr. Tajil. I am uh, assistant professor and head of department in emergency medicine in Khyber Medical College in Peshawar. I hope everybody is listening to me. Right? Yes, um, I, I've been a member of Royal College of Emergency Medicine. And um, um, it's a pleasure, it's a great pleasure to be with you all here. Um, the question, Faryal, do I need to answer any of these? Sir, someone has asked uh, how to differentiate between COVID pneumonia and pulmonary edema. All right. So um, first of all, yes, obviously, I must uh, congratulate Madam for presenting such a good, um, nice and concise presentation on emergency tests in emergency. Um, uh, question. So again, the, what we say, clinical correlation, clinical correlation, clinical correlation. It's, it is the message to take home today. Uh, heart failure and COVID, you will have a presentation, you will have a history. You can think about your points where a heart patient patient, mostly a heart failure patient would have a past history. They would have a heart attacks in the past. They would be diabetics and all that. As compared to that, COVID might be coming with an entirely different presentation. So you keep that in mind. That's, that helps you to have some idea. And then all the tests that you are doing in emergency, think about each and every test as you go along. The X-ray will not be easy to sort of differentiate altogether between the two. We do get stuck in the two 
most of the times. So antigen test is helping us there. You have to correlate. And, and to be honest, with, even with the, with the when you set them up, so you are going through your history, you've gone through the past history, you've gone through the medications, you have now done the blood tests, you have now got an ECG, you have got an X-ray, and you are checking the situations. You are looking at the patient as well. The COVID patient presenting the way they are sitting, the chronic um, heart failure patient, the way they present. So all these things help in the diagnosis. Obviously, if I joke, without going into the nitty gritty. Um, and then you get stuck with them. To be honest, in clinical practice, you do get stuck with them. That's where you have to be really very quick with your assessments and uh, get them into a sort of a suspicious world where you can do the rest of your tests to go one way or the other with the diagnosis as well. Yeah. So it is a process that comes with practice and with diligent correlation of your tests with the patient, I would say. Thank you, Kamata. Now we have Dr. Zahid Rafiq. Uh, I would like him to take over and introduce himself and then we'll move for further questions. Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, my name is Zahid Rafiq. I'm a family physician from Canada. So it's a long time when I was used to be in South Africa, I used to practice emergency medicine. So now just typical uh, office-based medicine. Um, that's a great session. I would commend Dr. Usmani. So it was an excellent session. Being virtual, still she involved the audience. And uh, that was great particip participation from them. And um, I think that's where, uh, that's where involvement comes and that's where learning comes. So my message for audience and especially how to correlate emergency medicine with family medicine, what at the family medicine level or doctor's office we can do is, uh, we have in Canada, like Canada is a publicly funded healthcare system. Uh, unlike America, there is all uh, paid by insurance and you can do tests, whatever you want to do. Uh, and I think we are more similar to a uh, British system where it's more a clinical medicine is most important, right? And I think we should go back to the same thing, go back to the clinical thing. Look at your patient. Um, we have in Canada, it's um, a movement started, uh, uh, it's called Choose Wisely Canada, meaning that just look at your patient, choose the test wisely, what you want to do. And if you are ordering a test, um, that, that should make sense. Like uh, have your differential diagnosis, investigation uh, should be accordingly. And then uh, to act on them, it's not the numbers, it's the patient in front of you. So you have to look at the patient, treat the patient accordingly. Like you don't have to spend like order just, uh, um, on the offset, just start CT scan, MRI and things or some back pain, you just go for um, CT scan. You have to look at the patient. You might not need 90% of the cases. You don't need any x-rays there. So uh, again, the message is like think wisely and uh, correlate things. And uh, I think uh, that that's at the family medicine level uh, is a basic thing. And ask for help if, <laughs> if it's needed, of course. Hey, Dr. Mohammed Azhar is asking, what are the contraindications for antiviral use in COVID positive patients? Antiviral? Uh, antivirals used in COVID positive patient. Uh, the thing is, uh, we, here we are in Canada, we are not using any antivirals uh, unless they are really it's needed. And I don't think if, if it's needed, I'm not sure if there are any contraindications. I'm not sure if there anybody else want to answer that. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. Now we are heading to Dr. Bakhtiar Ishtiak. Uh, I would like him to in introduce himself and then we are uh, going for a question and answer session. Okay. Asalaamu Alaikum. I'm Dr. Bakhtiar Ishtiak. I am an emergency physician in, uh, uh, in New York. And uh, <clears throat> I'm also board certified in pediatrics. And uh, these days, most of my time is uh, divided between um, the emergency department and urgent care medicine. Uh, so um, I just wanted to uh, congratulate Dr. Osmani on an excellent presentation. Uh, she really uh, was able to 
uh, get her points across and involve the audience, uh, which was uh, uh, a difficult task on uh, this kind of an online forum. Um, that being said, I just want to reiterate some of the uh, things that are being said by all the panelists and including the presenter. Um, know your context, which is basically know where you are, know your tools, know the resources that you have. Um, uh, to concede, uh, I was having difficulty following the, um, uh, the units used uh, in today's presentation, these are different units from what we use here, like Dr. Osmani said, and I was looking at these uh, presentations last night and I had to actually um, uh, work out the numbers to see what these values were. And so it is very, very important that you know uh, what numbers and values and units you're using because many mistakes in emergency medicine and clinical practice happens because we assume things which are not there. Um, secondly, uh, I'm, I'm looking at um, these questions in the chat box and, um, and there's very uh, uh, good and, and pertinent questions. I just want to comment on one question I saw somewhere and it says, what is the minimum investigation we should do in every ER, in, in every case in the ER. So I, um, I just want to, this is more a philosophical thing. There is no minimum investigation that you need to do in every case. Uh, the ER is, as most of you who work there uh, realize, it is not like the television shows and the dramas that we see on TV. It is a, for the most part, ER is a very mundane uh, thing. There are things happening in there. There are common things happening in there. And then you do have your trauma cases and your MIs and your strokes and so on. So my point is that there is no minimum investigation because there is no minimum case. Um, you may see a patient and frankly may not need to do anything. And then you may have this complicated patient where you essentially are doing everything out of the book. So please do not get into that mindset that every ER case that comes in front of you must have certain minimum investigations done. That is not the case. It is a clinical correlation, like the presenter said, and look at your case, make your differential diagnosis and see what investigations are needed to help you get through that differential diagnosis. And remember the emergency medicine is not internal medicine. Uh, I have a lot of respect for my internal medicine and primary care and specialist physicians. Uh, in the emergency department, our focus is managing the case and dispositioning the case. What we need to make sure is that the patient is safe and stable. And then we need to make sure where does this patient go? Does, it, does the patient go home or does the patient go into the hospital? There are many, many things that, and there are many smart physicians who will take over this patient after me, whether in the outpatient setting or the inpatient setting, and will do all the workup and justice to this patient. But my focus in the emergency department is to make sure that I have a patient who's stable or stabilized, and then I disposition the patient appropriately while I initiate the investigation and or the treatment of that patient. So one needs to be clear on the context, one needs to be clear when I'm working as a pediatrician in my office or in the floor, that is a completely different mindset that I'm working with. But in the emergency department, my mindset is different. So there are no minimum investigations, see your patient and clinically correlate it. Thank you. Um, sir, I have got a question. Um, Mr. Dr. Nan is saying what emergency procedure a family physician can do in his clinic and is allowed to then refer to the patient to ER. Okay, well, okay, look, uh, <laughs> ER is, um, as you all know, all of medicine is medical legal, but ER is the most medical legal part of medicine. So um, part of your answer is that uh, it is again contextual. There are things that are uh, 
allowed in the medical legal context in Pakistan or the UK or Canada, which may not be done in America and so on and so forth. So I'm not exactly clear about this question. I mean, uh, you see, they, they, uh, at least, okay, uh, let me speak from the American perspective. The emergency department has an obligation. Uh, no person can be turned away from the emergency department. It does not matter what you have. It can be a completely ridiculous thing, but if you show up in the United States in the emergency department and want to be seen by law, you have to be seen, period. There is no question about it. So after you see the patient, you're not obligated to do anything, meaning that same thing. There is no minimum stuff that you have to do to a patient, but you are obligated legally to what is called a screening medical exam. In the United States, any patient who comes to the emergency department has to get a screening medical exam from a physician. Once you do your screening medical exam, which essentially is you get your history and you do a quick physical, you look at the vital signs. And if you determine that this patient is safe and stable and can be discharged from the emergency department to seek help from his physician outside, you can do that. So in that, keeping that in mind, you can do any kind of procedure no procedure prevents you from referring the patient to the emergency department. So I, I don't know if uh, you can elaborate on your question, but really there is no procedure that prevents you from referring any patient to the emergency department. Thank you so much, sir. Now we are going uh, heading to Dr. Khalid Bashir. I would like uh, him to introduce himself and then we are going to end up the session. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me, Faryal? Yes, sir. Okay. So my name is Khalid. Um, I am a senior consultant in emergency. Um, I spent almost 25 years in UK, including 15 years as a consultant. Uh, I never had a chance to meet Hajra. Uh, I was one of the fortunate ones who became consultant before the college was formed. Um, Alhamdulillah, I was 33, head of the department. Uh, so um, the, the one investigation that uh, I commonly use is the point of care ultrasound. Uh, I think one of the uh, um, students or the trainees asked the question, how do you differentiate between um, a chest complaint, between PE, a cardiac complaint? I use the point of care ultrasound. And I think it requires little expertise and you can get a lot more information. And now most of the training programs, uh, not only in emergency medicine, uh, family medicine, internal medicine, they incorporate point of care ultrasound training um, mm -hmm. in the program. So by the time people graduate and they have a, a good knowledge. Uh, um, uh, so I think this is one of the things that trainees, they may wish to consider. I lived uh, most of my life in Wales as a consultant since uh, 2001. Um, so this is Wales is a remote area uh, with um, um, uh, the big hospitals far away. So we had to stabilize a lot of patients in-house. Uh, so the ultrasound was, you know, um, a very useful tool. Um, can I share a couple of things? Because I've been in this trade for so many years, I can give you two or three examples that the trainees will benefit uh, in relation to emergency investigations. Uh, in addition to the ultrasound as mentioned, and I think one of the things that we should try not to miss is pregnancy test in women of childbearing age. Uh, I can give you one example. We had a young lady, because where I lived, this was a tourist sport, um, the lady came in with abdominal pain and our trainee diagnosed as UTI, gave her antibiotics, and she traveled two hours, she went to London. Um, there's a town called Shrewsbury, she collapsed, taken to local hospital. She had a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So we had a, a claim of compensation a few months later. You know, UK is catching up with USA with claims and compensations. So we had a claim of uh, only 1,000 pounds. When they asked me to comment, I asked our solicitor to settle as soon as possible. So I think one learning is that we should never miss uh, urine pregnancy test test, at least in all women of childbearing age. Um, 
And the, the second example I want to give again for the point of care ultrasound, we had a, a young lady in her 30s um, collapsed at the airport, brought into emergency department, and the initial diagnosis was PE. Uh, she had a long flight. Even the ECG showed S1Q3T3, and she was tachypneic, tachycardic. We could not get a good history. And again, the ultrasound probe showed uh, pericardial effusion, almost tamponade. So we saved her life through point of care ultrasound by not giving her clot bursting drug. Um, so I think uh, I wanted to convey, please learn about point of care ultrasound. And um, I think somebody commented, maybe Zahid, ask for help. We are emergency physician, not an expert in every field. So I think when there is a suspicion, uh, we call for help. On my phone, I've got personal contacts of uh, internal medicine, neurosurgery. They are good friends of mine. So if I get stuck for the benef benefit of patient, I do contact my specialist colleagues uh, just to provide the optimum care for the patient. Um, I think I forgot to mention, I live in Qatar now for the last eight years. And Qatar has got one of the busiest emergency departments in the world. Uh, where I came from, from Wales, we used to see about 100 patients a day on a very busy day. Uh, our average used to be 60, 70. When I came here, and uh, the daily attendance was 1,600 patients a day. We have got two CT scanners 24 hours a day. We've got MRI scanner, many ultrasound. We have got our own radiology department. Um, so I'm blessed, Alhamdulillah, to see uh, treat patients and teach in the medical school.